The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning, and I want to welcome any of you who are visiting with us. My name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here at Southside Bible Church, and we are glad you are here with us. We're in between books that we're studying. We just finished up Second Peter. In about a month, we're going to start the book of Habakkuk. And so we're in kind of a season of freelancing for myself. Uh, last week, we looked at Ephesians 4, at the beauty of the church of God, that the body causes the growth of the body. And it's just so beautiful how much is happening in our midst and what God is doing. I'm just so blessed by what I am seeing in the outworking of faith. This morning, I want to take up the subject of worship, a topic that I just want us to understand well and to enter into fully. The Father is seeking worshipers, so that is what I am seeking for myself in this body, and anyone I come into contact with is I want worshipers of God, to, to go from worshipers of self in this world to become worshipers of the living God, and that is what we're going to take up this morning, so let's go to our God and pray that He'll meet every heart uh, and no one will leave here this morning without being a worshiper of God, and all the saints' hearts would be strengthened and blessed in the Word. Father, we come before you and we continue our worship through the Word of God. I pray that you will meet us in a powerful way in the passage that is before us. God, I pray that, that we would worship you. We would worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. I pray that you would bring us into this encounter with Jesus and this woman and he teaches us what true worship is. I, I pray that your spirit would teach all of us in our mind and in our hearts and will what it means to be a worshiper of the living God. Father, meet us here in a special way, I pray, uh, during this hour of worship in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and I want to look at worship, and uh, for the little kids, I, I made the simplest outline I think I've ever made, and we're going to look at what, why, and how. So if you're usually bored, just today might be a little different. Try your hardest to figure out what, why, and how. So our first question is, what is worship? It's ten times it occurs in John chapter 4 that we will look at this morning that this word worship is mentioned. That really is the focus of John and so I just want to ask that then, what is worship? And I want to start by looking at the Greek word and then the English word. And the Greek word that's used here for worship, it carries the idea of recognizing someone or something of superior value. It literally meant to prostrate yourself before a superior. It means to hit the dirt. God in his right place and myself in my right place before God which is the gospel. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ to get this right again where God's in the right place and I'm in the right place before Him. And so there are two parts to this act of worship. The first is the superiority of a being, of God. And the second then is the appropriate posture before that one who is to be worshipped. And it carried with it this idea then of having adoration for that object which meant to recognize the value of something in such a way that it, it changes you and it transforms you as you look upon this value. And so it takes you over and it really empowers you, this idea of worship. Secondly, the English word worship comes from this worth-ship. And it really, I think, helps us kind of understand this idea of worship. So I want to grab an illustration that I heard this week, and yet I want to bring it into my own practical life. My mom gave my daughter, Kelsey, a beautiful necklace that had been handed down from her grandmother to her mother to her, and, and she gave it to Kelsey because they were born on the exact same day, and it had a birthstone in it, and Kelsey loves it. And, and every night, whenever she wears it, she'll put it on her dresser or, or, or wherever, but it, it just kind of take it off and set it down. And for the sake of illustration, I want you to picture this. Let's say one day we, we have someone over for dinner, and this person just happens to be a jeweler. And all of a sudden, she, they see the necklace, and they say, Kelsey, let me take a look a little closer at that necklace. And he or she examines it, and they, they say, wow, this necklace is so valuable. 
It was made by a famous craftsman in the 17th century who it is so rare and it's so valuable. This thing could be worth millions of dollars, Kels. Well, what happens at that point? Your attitude toward the jewelry changes almost instantly. You, you look closely at it and maybe to admire it and you begin to see the, the cut stones and the beauty of it. And, and now there, there's a beauty maybe that you didn't even see before. And you begin to think of all the implications that this piece of jewelry might have in your life right now. The value of it is going to impact your life greatly right this moment. And so it's going to now change your behavior toward it. You're not just going to throw it in a drawer that night when you go to bed. You're going to buy a safe and you're going to lock it up so that no one can steal it. And it might cost you $1,000 to get it clean to make it more value. And that will be like nothing. I'll spend that $1,000 like nothing where before I would have never spent $1,000 on this necklace. This is worth ship. The jeweler led you to worship by showing you the value of the gems in this necklace. And it now will fill your mind and give you joy and change your behavior and you will invest in it. And it will change the way you think and the way you act and the way you plan because of it. And this beautifully illustrates the worship of God. When the Spirit opens your eyes to the worship of God, you assign Him ultimate value in your life and you invest everything in this person of the Godhead. And there's such worth then to have Him in your life as Robert preached a couple weeks ago, you don't throw him now into a drawer like many do in our day. He now has a worth above all else and here my life to this God. And what came to mind as I was thinking on this was Isaiah 6 when uh, King Uzziah dies and he'd been king for 52 years. And Isaiah heads into the temple and when he goes in, he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe is filling the temple. And, and all these angels and seraphim are saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah sees the, the majesty and the worth of this God. And suddenly he curses the most righteous thing as his, his own mouth. My, my, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Uh, this is terrifying to see this God. And then that, that angel comes and gets the tongs and takes the coals and touches his lips to show uh, the Hebrew word for atonement, that, that his sins have been removed. And now God says, I have something needed. Go preach to the nations. And by the way, none of them are going to listen to you. <laughs> You're going to keep preaching and calling them to salvation and repentance, and they're just not even going to listen to you. And Isaiah says, here I am, God. Send me. Here, here's my life. I've seen the worth of God. And now I'll, here I am, God. Whatever you want from me is my worship to the value of who this God is. And so my question this morning is, have you tasted of real worship? When the reality of God's wisdom and his love and his power and his provision become more real to you than anything else, what we're holding on to becomes so small. Uh, they become trinkets. All the vain things that charmed me most, I sacrifice them to your blood, to your cross. That's worth ship. And so in closing up this first point, what is worship? It entails two parts. It's seeing the value of God, and it's giving to God what is His due. Therefore, I offer up my body a living sacrifice to God. Uh, his due is all of my being, my heart, mind, soul, and strength to love him. And so that is, there's a value to God and now he's worthy of everything. My life, my calling, my dreams, he's worthy of everything now. And guys, that's what the Father is seeking in our text. He's not wanting dead religion, playing games. God is seeking those who will be worshipers in spirit and in truth. The great commission is go make worshipers of this God who follow Jesus Christ. That's worship. Second, why, why do so few people worship this God if he's so valuable and glorious? I just go out every day looking at a world with people who won't worship this God. Why? 
why won't they worship this God? Let me just read uh, an old passage that uh, Nick preached a long time ago in 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. They can't see his value. They can't see his worth. But the gospel is when God says, let there be light, and now you see the value, the worship of God, and you give your life to this God. And so I want to flush this out in our text if you'll come to John 4. In our passage, this woman from Samaria, she comes to a well at the sixth hour. She comes to draw some water And Jesus is sitting there. And he's going to come and he's going to offer to this woman living water. And this woman is so locked up with five husbands and a living boyfriend that this living water can't flow into her heart. And she can't be set free for this living water to flow into her heart and soul and bring 10,000 reasons to worship the living God and cry, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. If there are any in that state this morning, I'm just praying for you. I'm asking God, I just want the living water to break into your heart this morning. And so I just want you to come with me and look at the beauty of what Jesus is going to do in this encounter with this woman. And so let me explain. We're going to begin in verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So you you shouldn't be talking to me in that day and age. I'm a woman and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me this? And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who who gave him the well where they're sitting, who gave us that and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And the woman said, Sir, give me this water. I will not be thirsty nor come all the way out here to draw again. I want this kind of water. Let me have it. I don't want to keep coming and getting water again and again at this well. I I want this water that you're talking about where I'll never get thirsty again. And now in verse 16, there comes this twist. In verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come here. Where does that come from? I don't know about you. Doesn't that seem just a little bit strange? I'm going to give you living water. Yeah, I want that water. Go get your husband. I'm talking about living water. And she's thinking in the physical. I I, I would love to never have to come to the well again. I want this magic water, please. And the woman's answer is absolutely uh, remarkable in verse 17. Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband For you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. (laughs) Which means bullseye. (laughs) Why did Jesus go here? Why do you leave living water behind when that's what this whole chapter is about? And just so abruptly say, now, go get your husband. Well, I want you to see if our text can unfold that answer for us this morning. And one thing we see clearly, that the living water was a swing and a miss. She didn't get it. And so Jesus is now coming in another angle 
because he wants to unbind this woman and let living water flow in, into her heart. I want you to be overwhelmed with the love of Christ. I want to unbind this heart. I'm not going to walk away with just this living water question. So what he is doing, Jesus is omniscient. He knew that this woman was living with a man. And he knew that she had five husbands. And we, don't, we aren't told that they died, but I think the flavor and the feel is that they left her, they divorced her, and you just keep going from husband to husband. And so he's coming in now and he's opening up that heart, which is just stopped up. It's blocked by sin. And the sin is damming up the grace of living water that Jesus wants to offer. And most likely, she's wanting to be loved. And she's being used again and again and again by different men. She's just usury. And Jesus is coming right into the inside of her heart. I'm coming in. I'm getting in. I'm going to deal with the internal where the living water cannot flow. So I'm going to go to the inside and I'm going to break this heart open because I have something to give you that will make you never thirst again. I want you to hear this clearly. The living water can only be drunk by the heart. You, you can't get it in any other way. It's got to come into the heart. Jesus will not have ritualism and he will not have externalism in his worship. It's going to go right into the heart. That's what this new covenant is about. I'm going to give you a new heart. And Pharisees have, have no place in his kingdom who all you're about is the externals of religion and doing all the outside. This is about a Christ who wants to come to the inside of the core of your being and give you living water that will refresh and transform and change everything about you. He will go to the inside. I want you to listen to what he said just a chapter back in John 3.20. For everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. And here's this woman. She hates the light and it's shining on her. Five husbands, all of your sin, it's being revealed and all you can say is I could tell you're a prophet and you're running from the light. You don't want to deal with it. Do you see this? This woman's inner life is so locked up with sin and guilt and shame and hurt and loneliness and emptiness. That might be your, your portrait this morning as you came in here. That's where she's at. Just man to man trying to find love. Every rejection and just getting a little harder every time you see it again and again. I had a lady share with me just a little while ago that she's on this thing called Tinder. And she just goes from man to man, and she says, all I want to do is be loved. And in the morning, when I text them, they won't even answer me back. I can't even find love and usury. And this is the, the picture of this woman here. I just want to find love, and I can't find it. And Jesus said, ma'am, I did not come for the healthy, but I came for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous, the squeaky clean, came for sinners, among whom I am foremost. And Jesus wants living water from him to flow into this woman's soul. The friend of sinners. He wants to unlock this heart and set it free in himself to be a worshiper of God. To be living water to her, to satisfy her soul so it will never thirst again. That's what he wants to give to this thirsty soul. And so I want you to hear this so bad. God will not stay on the outside. He's going to press to the inside. And so many people just want to keep him on the outside like this woman. And an external God you're happy with. And you would love to keep him there. But this is a Christ who's coming and hunting down for the inside. That is who the Father is seeking. That's what he wants for his kingdom. But look what this woman does in verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. I've heard this so many times. <laughs> the subject that she didn't want to deal with is living water and worship. <laughs> 
I don't even want to deal with that. Let's go somewhere else. It's a better subject than being completely exposed and someone telling you you have five husbands and the guy you're living with now isn't. Let's go back to worship. Get away from that. The light is shining on the depth and the recesses of my heart. Let's get that light back off. Turn it off. Let's talk about worship again. But let's talk about external worship. I don't want to get on the inside. That's how we, we, we all thought as unbelievers. Where, where do we worship? What ritual? What, what form? Do we kneel down or not? We're just lost in external, dead, cold things that don't matter. Jesus is going to get right to the heart of worship this morning. And the irony is that this is exactly where Jesus wanted to bring it back, to worship. But he wanted her heart open and exposed and laid bare for how bad it needed this Christ, this living water, to come fill it, to fill her with worship. Now let's go back to the subject now that you're ready to hear about it. So Jesus exposed her soul thirst that she didn't even know she had. Just a little slave chasing Love, looking for it. She had a deep desire to be loved. That is being made in the image of God. And she's been looking for love in all the wrong places and all the wrong faces. And Christ has come and exposed her soul thirst. And that this life has left her thirsty and locked up and broken and used and empty. So now living water could flow into that heart. And my heart for anyone sitting here this morning who's tied up in something, it's keeping you from living water flowing. If it's sex, to be loved, and all the expressions of twistedness of pornea, if it's just running from job to job or church to church, the, the church isn't Jesus. <laughs> it worships Jesus. <laughs> Let Jesus fill our hearts. You go from vacation to vacation, hobby to hobby, location to location. Uh, your, your, your family is, you're, you're sick over it. There's an anxiety and there's fear and you're just locked up with your family. And it just owns you and you can't get out of it. You're just locked up and living water can't flow into your heart because these big idols in your life. I want to give you living water this morning that will flow into your heart and you will never thirst again. Christ will be joy to your heart and worship will flow like a river. That's what Jesus wants for his Father. And so Jesus, the master evangelist, he's showing this woman her soul is made with great desires, deep, deep desires. Your soul was made to drink deeply, to drink deeply from the one who's offering you living water. It's been made for it. And if you don't, you're going to drink from your husbands and your boyfriends and all the other cheap substitutes for this living water. You'll go chase everything else but this. I just ask you, are you meeting yourself in this woman this morning? Jesus knows your heart. There's, there's no hiding it. I perceive you are a prophet. I know every detail of every life, Jesus says. And, and does it need living water this morning? And one last point before we move on to our next point. What this woman does is she lies with the truth, doesn't she? She doesn't really want to deal with her heart. She'll do whatever is necessary not to face who she is and what she's doing. She doesn't want to face it. Her need for living water, I, I just I don't want to deal with it. I want to run away from it. And then you'll share with people and they'll say, you know what, I, I'm fine. I'm doing just fine. I don't need this living water. What about dinosaurs? <laughs> In light of Jesus? Well, I hear what you're saying, but what about gay marriage? What about all the contradictions in the Bible? This lady will not let the truth shine on her heart, and she just keeps trying to run from it because they run from the light. Are you doing that this morning? You just keep running from the light and finding excuses for why you won't drink this living water that Jesus Christ is offering to you. Are you hiding the truth from yourself? Well, I want you to listen to her. In verse 20, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. In dodging her sin, 
she throws out the debate between these two nations, which is worship as a place of geography. What's going on here? Well, the Samaritans, they had made a temple, and they say, this is where you're really supposed to worship. And the Jews are saying, no, it's in Jerusalem where the presence of God dwells in the temple. That's where you worship. And they hate each other over this issue and some other things with it, but they, there's a hatred. Remember the good Samaritan that they'll walk right by him and not deal with him? They hate one another. But this woman made a mistake of going back to worship because that's where Jesus wanted to bring her. And Jesus wants on the inside, he wants her heart. Water didn't work, adultery didn't work, worship in which place? But Jesus wants her to be a worshiper of God from the heart, from the inside, and made full in him. He continues. And that'll be our third point, is how. How then do we worship? Look with me in verse 21. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, and we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And so the answer to her question is neither. Neither. There's, there's an hour coming where we're going to quit worshiping in a place of geography, and we're going to begin to worship a person. For you guys worship what you don't know. We worship what we know, which has been the promise of Messiah, that he would come, and what Messiah would do and bringing these people to God. And so we have this wisdom, we have this knowledge. All of history is kind of climaxing in this point. And in verse 23, but an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. That should take your breath away. An hour is coming, and now is. And Jesus and John talked about this hour several times. And every time he did, it was about his coming death. Father, take me from this hour, but this hour is why I came. The soldiers come to arrest him. My time is at hand. It's time, my hour. And so when I breathe my last breath, hanging on a cross, te telestai, it's finished, I'm going to change worship forever. It'll no longer be a geographical place. You don't have to make a trek to Jerusalem to meet God and to make sacrifices. Something new is coming, and it will not be in geography, but it will be in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Two chapters earlier, he said, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it in three days. I'm the temple. I'm the place where you're going to worship the living God. I am the meeting place between God and man. Here it is. I am the place that this whole world will draw near to worship the living God. I'm it. In verse 42 of chapter 4, they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and we know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the Messiah. This is the one that we have been looking for. I'm going to blow open a hole between God and man. And now you'll be able to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace to worship God. And you see, this is so big what Jesus is saying. Because what would happen if you drew near in the Old Testament to worship God? Or if even today you've come and you've begun to get a sense of His majesty and His greatness and you said, I'm going to go to church to find God. What happens when you see God is you feel unworthy and you draw back and you hide. You run to the colts. What must I do to appease this majestic God? Give me something to appease Him because I'm a sinner and I need some help bad. You'll make up excuses. You'll lie with the truth like this woman to avoid God. Uh, you'll, you'll very much be an avoider of this God. We cannot draw near to God and worship or we will retreat in shame and hide and try to make coverings and try to appease Him with our sacrifices. Here is what this woman needs. A way to be forgiven and a way to be clothed in His righteousness so that she can draw near to God and worship in the beauty of holiness. 
and ascribe to God his great worth, that living water could flow into that broken, damned up heart. Jesus is the only way to worship God. He's the only way to draw near to God in peace and acceptance. You cannot worship apart from Jesus Christ. You cannot approach this God apart from what he is saying, my hour is about to come. Apart from my work on this cross, there'll be no approach. But because of this work on the cross, I give living water to anyone who wants this to come into their soul and set them free to give worship to this God. In verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is what I want for Southside Bible Church. I want worshipers of God in Christ. And in Christ, we see his worth because he gave us his son. And we give to him all that we are. Worship is just giving God your whole being because he's worthy. Because he gave us his son to bring us back. That's worship. And he says, we'll do this in spirit and in truth. What, is that? what does that mean? I'm going to try to make it quick. The spirit is the beauty of the new covenant. In the last chapter, Nicodemus came to Jesus and wanted to enter the kingdom. And he said, unless you're born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. You must be born again if you're going to worship God and enter into his kingdom. And he said, that which is flesh is flesh. All the externals, you'll never get there. But this new spirit being born again is how we will enter in and worship God. That which is spirit is spirit. It's the internals and it's our inner soul, heart, and being being made alive to God. It's the heart and it's the spirit now making you when you were dead in trespasses and sin. He made you alive and he's given you taste buds now for the living God. So you've been from a dead corpse, you've been made alive now to this God. I'm alive to God in every way because of this spirit who caused me to be born again. And now I see his worth-ship. And it's transforming me. <laughs> and it's changing all that I am as I keep beholding this Christ and being metamorphosed into his image. And those who are going to worship me are going to worship me then in spirit, being born again and made alive to this God. And you're going to do it in truth. And John 14, 6, a little later in this book, John's going to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so we're born again by the Spirit. We're given His Spirit. And in John 16, 14, he said, the role of the Holy Spirit is I'm going to shine a light on Jesus. And so the role is this new covenant is I'm going, to, I'm going to put a light and you're going to see the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ in all of his truth. He is the truth. And he's living water. He's the savior of the world. And we go to the Father in the truth of Jesus in spirit being made alive to come and worship the living God. And that is what the Father is seeking. That's what he wants. People born again to him who worship in the truth of Jesus Christ and what he has done to bring us into the presence and access to God. That's what we did here this morning. That's what the Father wants. And so spirit is the new birth and the desire and the delight in God from the internal, from the heart, no longer externals. And it's all in the truth and the revelation and picture of Jesus Christ. I worship in the truth of Jesus. That's how we can worship because he's done it all and I can draw near to God and this living water now can come into my heart and unbind it. That is what all of history has been pointing to in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When the one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I'm the one that you've been looking for for thousands of years. I'm the fulfillment of Abraham and David. All of these promises, everything in the law and the temple, here, here it is. It's all been coming to this day where I would take that, that veil would be torn in two by my life and sacrifice. 
so that worship now will be coming into the very presence of this God in spirit and in the truth of what Christ has done for us. And that's why we have a banner hanging in our church somewhere. If it's not up, it needs to be up next Sunday. It's an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. And in truth, those are the ones that the Father seeks. And so every time when we gather together corporately, we gather to worship God. And His worth has taken over our hearts. I love just looking out at this body and we... Uh, this world I, I watch where no one will worship this God. And now we come as these aliens and strangers and we gather to see the worth of this God and to come ascribe praise and adoration and glory that is due His name. And as we do, it's, it's transforming us. And it owns us. It now takes over our dreams and our hopes, our plans, our resources, and our time. It just, your whole life, take my life and let it be. That's it. We give it to Him in worship and adoration because of who He is and what He gave us in Jesus Christ. That's why the New Testament doesn't give us all the ritual and systems and how to do all of this worship. There's some that He gives us, but very little. And I think spiritual declension is when you start looking to all the externals of worship for your worship. And spiritual growth is when you just look to Christ and you give him worship in spirit and in truth. Boom. That's what the Father's seeking. And this is what he wants us to be as the people of God. To let this living water flow into your hearts and set you free and have sins washed away and be wrapped in his righteousness and now have full access to God to worship. Unbelievable what we have. And so as we just close out, just some application is this is a worship service then from beginning to end. We gather to ascribe to God His worth and we gather to do it in spirit and in truth. And we do it through preaching. And when the Word of God is preached, we we see the worth of God and we worship Him. And when we read God's word, like Malachi 1, and he says, I wish you'd just close your gates if you're going to come give me your leftovers. You little weak and blind animals. Would you give it to your governor? How about me, almighty God? And so we, we, we hear that word and we worship and say, oh God, don't let me give you my sloppy leftovers. And we pray to God and we worship together that as we pray, we're all going into the presence of God because of Jesus Christ. We're worshiping in spirit and in truth. And then last week we saw we have fellowship that as we do that, it gives God glory and praise for His wisdom and what He has done in the church of God. And then we sing. Singing is worship to God as well. And we we sing praises and declare His worth together in the joy of just in spirit and in truth. We get to come worship and draw near because of Jesus Christ. What a blessing. And since we're at a big transition in our expression of worship where we do it through singing and praises to our God, I wanted to address a few thoughts on that in application. And so first, our desire is that we ascribe God His worth and His value to us and our great love to Him. That's why we gather. And we're going to seek to do it through hymns and choruses and, and uh, spirit and truth. And, and what's funny, well, it's not funny, it's sad. What the Father is seeking is worshipers. That's what He wants. They forget themselves and they glory in God and Christ Jesus. And that through, through worship, through music, has become one of the most divisive points in the American church today. Worship. There's just... All the different ways that we can express our worship and our praises to our God, <laughs> and it's become a battleground. Spiritual decline will bring about, we'll get so worried about the way instead of the one, the method more than the master, the state of the art instead of the state of the heart. 
will drift. And so I just want to call us as a church to the kind of worship that we just read about that God is seeking. To come worship Him in spirit and in truth. I've been made alive to God, and through Jesus I can draw near, and my soul has been made alive with living water. I worship a person, not a place. And we gather in here to all worship this person of Jesus Christ in the Godhead. To come in the oneness of what we learned last week in truth. One Lord, one faith, one God, one baptism. And we come together in that with a unity of the Spirit, with the person of Jesus Christ, to offer up our worship to Him from beginning to end of the day. The joy of being God's blood-brought children. To hear His Word read and proclaimed and sing praises and just get lost in Him. The Lord's day is my best day. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Worshiping in spirit and truth, you don't have to be motivated to come do that. We get to come worship this God together every Sunday because of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to say this as plain as I know how to. To be critical of worship is a sad place to sit. Criticizing worship isn't where you want to sit. Rather than lost in love and wonder and praise and spirit and in truth, this isn't my choice of genre. The sound isn't mixed the way I like it. There's too many people up there. There's not enough people up there. Oh, goodness. Spirit and in truth is what God wants from his people. I remember my brother Steve was converted and saved from the vineyard. And he came to this reformed church that only had an organ that was 100 years old. And all we sang was hymns and nobody sang because we hardly had any joy And I remember looking up the first Sunday and he's standing in the front like this. And everybody staring at him like, what's wrong with that guy? I'll tell you what's right with him. He worships in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't matter what the forms are. It's this Christ and this God who's worthy of my worship wherever you throw me. In Africa, they'll sit and sit around trees and worship for hours. Some of you have sat there doing it with them. I'll spend hours with no air conditioning. I just want to worship this God because of Christ. Instead, I got to have this and that and amplifiers and all this nonsense. Stop! He's seeking worshipers in spirit and in truth. And I just want everyone to repent of judgmental, critical spirits about worship and just say, is it spirit? And is it in truth? And can anyone stop this from flowing in my heart? If a style of worship can, then it's not spirit and in truth. And we gather together in the power that we get to draw near to this God and worship together. Oh, I pray that you get this. So here's what we're going to do in our worship through singing. And I hope you keep hearing me say that, through singing. Singing is not, we think singing is worship and everything else is something different. It's all worship. And so as David retired, uh, I just, I I love the uh, um, expression of love that you gave to him last week. That touched him deeply. And so with David, we've been training some men and leaders for our worship. And we've sought men who know what I just preached on. That they're worshipers of God all week. They desire to lead us to the throne of grace to worship in spirit and in truth, and they're going to pick songs that are spirit and truth, and I put the hound of heaven on them, well, just the hound of earth, Greg Kurtz, and he's going to watch every song. Is it spirit and is it truth? And we're going to respect all ages and selections, and and last week we're going to just worship. If, If someone 80 loves that song and someone 20 loves that song, I'm just happy that they're worshiping in spirit and in truth because it's not about me, it's about God. And they'll practice so to not be a distraction. And, and we're humans, and I, I like when things go wrong. So we were reminded we're just a bunch of earthly people trying to worship a perfect God. They're going to pray, and they're going to seek to lead in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
so that God would be glorified in us joining in one voice to sing our praises to this great God and worship because that's what the Father is seeking. And Pastor Greg Kurtz is going to oversee this ministry to see that that is done. And yesterday, I got to meet with everyone who was wanting to serve in that ministry, and there's a few more who will do another day. But what Greg and I saw, we were in tears and having goosebumps with a bunch of people who just want to worship God. And so I love that that those who want to help in the singing aspect of our worship service, just beautiful hearts that it's about him. So we're just rejoicing in leaders and those who want to help, uh, just hearts in the right place. And, and every once in a while, you can see a heart just out of tune. Remember, tune my heart to sing thy praise. And, and just please let this be about God and God alone. And thank you to those who came and helped. Uh, yesterday. And so I'm going to seek to do the same in preaching. That I'll always be praying and studying this Word of God, and, and it would be worship to us. In the scripture reading and prayer, Sean Killian spent time just praying over that passage for you guys and praying for you. And the, the, the prayer is that anyone then who will walk into this building would just say, Surely God is in this place. And so may we join the Father and seeking worshipers of him in spirit and in truth. That he would be our all and all, and that he would be the glory in the church. And that is what we would spend and be spent for. So just, I want to see worshipers of this God, and it breaks my heart to go out in this world and watch people who won't worship this God. Give our lives to make worshipers of the living God, and then let this be assembly of those who worship the living God in spirit and in truth. Soli Deo Gloria. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this encounter in John 4. God, I thank you just seeing a Christ who wants to take stopped up hearts, hearts that are so broken and so lost, and he wants living water to flow into them. The reality, the fullness of Christ and what he has done for us and has brought about a reconciliation. He's brought about peace with God. And so, Father, I, I pray that the way that you made this peace would cause everyone in this room to be worshipers and that our spirits have been born again. They've been made alive to you and that we worship in the truth of Jesus Christ. We draw near because of him, and we sing praises because of him. And so I just thank you for the privilege to gather with those who love Christ and believe and treasure that beautiful Savior. God, I thank you for that, and that their spirits have been made alive to this Christ, and all they want is more of him. God, meet that thirst. Keep filling it with the Word of God, and then let our praises just uh, resound and, and, and be made beautiful as we sing to a God like this. So you are uh, worth ship. Oh God, you are worthy of our songs and you are worthy of our lives. Moment by moment, second by second, let us worship you 24-7, oh God. You seek worshipers. And I pray that Southside Bible Church would be worshipers of this glorious, majestic God. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments, or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website, at southsidebible.org.